Yeah. Well, now, to reflect on this calendar of mess, I'm joined by the U.S. Managing Editor of the Financial Times, Gillian Tett, the Chief Economist at the Nomura Research Institute, Richard Koo, and from Stanford by the political economist and author, Francis Fukuyama. Uh, Richard Koo, how much longer are we going to have to put up with this? It's going to go on for a long time yet, is it? Once the private sector realises that their balance sheet's underwater, and you can see that from British private sector actually paying down debt, even with this record low interest rates, you know, people are not supposed to pay down debt when interest rates are low. They should be borrowing money. But the opposite is happening in this country. Same in the U.S., you, uh, in Spain, Portugal, all of these places, private sector sorts are paying down debt with zero interest rates. And that's basically what happened to us in Japan 15 years earlier. And when everybody's paying down debt and no one's borrowing money, the economy is not going to be doing very well until well, private sector balance sheets are repaired. How long do you think we're going to have to wallow around well, in this mess? I would like to give Richard Koo some credit because I first met him 15 years ago in Tokyo and he was talking about this idea of balance sheet recessions, i.e. you have so much debt you simply can't get out of it through normal means. And back then people thought this was a weird idea, it was just Japan, it would never happen anywhere else. The tragedy is though that what we've seen unfold in Japan that Richard Koo was talking about a long time ago is playing out. And unfortunately, it means a long period of belt tightening, a long period of quite a lot of stagnation with accompanying social tensions. Because Japan has enough social cohesion to ensure that societies have hung together, even through this lost decade or two. The big question now is, does Europe, does the UK, does the US? Uh, Francis Fukuyama, what's your assessment of that? So I'm just going to have to interrupt you there, Mr. Fukuyama, uh, Professor Fukuyama, because we seem to have lost the sound from Stanford rather brilliantly. Uh, we'll get back to you just First. as soon as we... We'll, oh, there you are. Are you back with us? Yes. Sorry, I was asking... The suggestion Gillian <laughs> Tett was that, w w made was that it would take a lot of social cohesion to come through these, these times, and she doubted whether we all had it. What do you think? Well, I think the, uh, the social cohesion... Uh, is a problem. The, the basic problem is in the political systems. Both the United States and Europe have decision-making systems that provide a lot of vetoes to people that are hurt by any particular decision that's made. And that's what's paralyzed the budget process in Washington. Uh, and that's really what's pro uh, uh, paralyzed the decision-making pro uh, process in Europe, where you've got uh, an EU with 27 potentially veto-wielding uh, members and a smaller group of 17 uh, each of which uh, has its own domestic politics and domestic audiences that have to be brought along. And that's a very, very long-term and, and difficult process. Yeah. Uh, implicit, indeed, explicit in that is the idea that democracies just can't cope with this sort of thing. You can see it in the States, they can't agree a budget. You can think we can't agree it in Europe unless you put in governments of technocrats. I mean, well, I think it's a bit more subtle than that. I think countries vary in the degree of their social cohesion. And frankly, nobody in the economics world was even talking about this four years ago. People mm. thought was economics was just about the numbers and putting things into spreadsheets. But Japan's a country that does have a lot of social cohesion. The US has been founded by pilgrims with the belief that growth is permanent, you never run out of resources, you keep making the pie bigger, so you never have to worry about how to divide the pie up. And if you look across Europe today, it's fascinating. Some countries like Ireland still appear to have quite a high level of social cohesion, other parts do. And the really big question now is, is there actually any cohesion across the Eurozone as a whole in terms of a allocating pain? What's your assessment, Richard Koo? Well, uh, Gillian was nice enough to mention about my concept of balance sheet recession, where private sector is minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits. We never learned this in universities. Mm -hmm. exactly. And so everybody is lost. Because whatever that we learn in universities never train us for a situation like this, where private sector is paying down the, with zero interest rates, minimizing debt instead of maximizing profits. Everything we learn in university is based on the assumption that private sector is maximizing profits. All of that theory goes out the window when private sector has a balance sheet problems, they have negative equity, they have to pay down debt. And when everybody's doing this all at the same time, economy will be very weak for a very long time except with the government help. If the government borrows and spends on top of it, then you can maintain GDP. And that's basically part of the Japanese story. Jap Japanese GDP never fell below the peak of the bubble the entire 20-year period. Unemployment rate never went higher than 5.5%. That, because government was borrowing and spending the excess savings in the private sector. That's what kept the Japanese society going. 
but that's not how it is playing out in the US but, and the UK. Let me just bring in Francis Fukuyama here and just ask, ask you, are you relatively upbeat, Francis Fukuyama? These are unprecedented circumstances and many people say they're only going to be solved by a fundamental sorting out of the imbalance between developing nations and the developed nations. Well, there, there's problems on, on multiple levels, uh, even before you get to the structural imbalances in the global economy for which we've got really no uh, solution. You've got these uh, EU-wide and, and national level uh, 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 political uh, obstacles. Uh, I think in terms of the earlier discussion of social cohesion, one of the things that's been revealed is that while Germans in their own welfare state may feel a sense of obligation towards poorer Germans and want to take care of them, they have absolutely no sense of obligation uh, towards Greeks or other people that they think are behaving uh, uh, irresponsibly. And it means that there's been, you know, in a sense, a, a deeper problem in the EU that there's no common sense of citizenship. There's no sense of identity that uh, extends obligation uh, across the whole of an area that is in many ways uh, comparable to the United States in terms of the size of the population and the size of the overall uh, economy. And the political systems really do not force, uh, they, they haven't been able to take advantage of this crisis to force a decision. And that's really what is the terrible irony of, of, of the last three years. Gillian Ted. I mean, another way of saying it is the key question hanging over the West now is how do you allocate pain? There's too much debt, there's going to have to be cutbacks, but are you simply going to stuff all the pain onto the weakest members of society, onto the debtors? Will you hurt the creditors? Can other countries do what Japan has done, which is basically find a way of actually sharing out the pain in a, in a manner that ensures that everyone continues to buy in? That's the key question. And frankly, if you look at Congress and the great fights going on there right now with the budget, it's really about how are you actually going to allocate the pain. And nobody really wants to talk about it openly because guess what? It's not the kind of thing that gets politicians elected. Richard Kuhn. Well, if, <coughs> if you sorry, avoid... Uh, let me just bring in Francis Fukuyama there. Go on, go on. Oh, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. The, you know, the, in, a, in a certain sense, Japan has also not faced up to certain structural problems in its economy. Uh, and I think the fact that it's not really experienced a, uh, you know, a real recession or a real uh, a drop in, in growth that's been prolonged uh, has allowed politicians to continue to dither on, on, on certain basic issues like liberalization of its agricultural sector. And so that's not, it, it's, mm. there's cohesion, but it's a cohesion that uh, has blocked them from actually addressing some of the real uh, problems, decisions they have to face up to. Richard Koo. Well, structural problems are in every economy. Our U.S. has certain structural problems, the U.K., Japan, everybody has certain structural problems. But those are, those you cannot explain what happened to the Japanese economy for the last 20 years. I mean, it was such a powerful economy all the way up to the end of the 80s, and bang, the bubble burst, and suddenly all the forward momentum was lost. And same here in UK, same in the US, same in large parts of Europe as well. That is not a structural problem. It's a balance sheet problem. And the private sector, once every several decades, go crazy about the bubble. And once the bubble bursts, they realize that they really screwed up. And balance sheets underwater, financial health is lost. Everybody tries to repair their balance sheets all at the same time. But when everybody tries to repair balance sheets all at the same time, the economy suffers. It's a massive fallacy of composition. Everybody's doing the right things, but the economy then weakens because no one's borrowing and spending money. Instead, everybody's saving money. And if everybody's saving money, is no one borrowing money, even with zero interest rates, there's no way economy can move forward. I'm going to say, I mean, Paul in his clip earlier put it very nicely in terms of the sea change of mentality that's going on. And economists used to re refer to the period before 2007 as the era of great moderation because there was this belief that you had low inflation, stable growth, central banks had triumphed, economists understood the world and could predict the future. I mean, now we're living in an era of great angst, if you like, not moderation, because frankly, the economists are increasingly at sea, and there's a realization that there aren't any easy ways to actually predict the future, far less actually resolve what's going on right now. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.